Yeah. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> says zombie land. Not now you see me. See me. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Recotopia, a happy home for recommended movies, shows, and music from two people you can definitely trust. Trustability varies by region, no guarantee is implied. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Atkinson and Jeremy Scott. What are you trembling for? The wine. It's deadly poison. I fixed it. You did? I remember how thoughtful of you. For years, I've misjudged your poison for you. Oh, no, no, no. It was for me. For you? Yes, I couldn't stand it any longer. I even wrote a confession. You what? A confession? Hello, everybody. It is... Recotopia episode 50. We made it to 50. <laughs> and that's what that was all about. That was that showed up on my screen just before the uh inter- the little uh opening thing happened or whatever. I was like, what the fuck? Is this? Oh, um awesome. uh anyway, um I'm Chris Atkinson. I'm Jeremy Scott. <clears throat> And uh, today's uh, big recommend is the Inspector General from 1949, Danny Kaye movie. Uh, welcome, chatters out there on Twitch and YouTube, coming hey, out hey. here to watch us on a Tuesday do this podcast. Uh, we appreciate you coming out every week. Um, Jeremy, do you have any small recommends? It's no big deal. It's so small and light. It's small. It's tiny. It's petite. It's wee. I do. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to get in early so that nobody else can claim this one. Um, okay. And I'm going to recommend the last of us on HBO. I have <laughs> okay. personally only seen the premiere episode. I've seen it three times now. I like it so Damn. much. Um, and, uh, I like a lot of HBO shows that come on late Sunday evening, I end up watching them somewhere between Monday and Wednesday uh, of the following week. So there has been a second episode. By the time this podcast airs, there will have been a third episode. Uh, but the premiere is solid enough uh, for me to give this two enthusiastic thumbs up, even if you've never played the game. Uh, I know one person who never played the game and kind of enjoyed it, the show. Uh, mm-hmm. But I know three people who never played the game who think the show is rad. I have played the game and think the show is rad. Uh, the casting is on the nose. Um, this is from the showrunner of the game and the guy that made that Chernobyl show. Huh. Um, and we have Pedro Pascal playing Joel, and we have Bella Ramsey, Game of Thrones fame, playing Ellie. Uh, you are yourself, Chris, playing through this game on Twitch. Yep. Um, and I have been catching, you've been doing it on Monday evenings, and it's been fun mm-hmm. to pop in and uh, watch you uh, explore and experience the game. Um, and I had somebody ask me, should I watch the game first or play the game first or watch the show first? And I don't really think it matters. I think uh, the story, the essence of the story is going to be the same. So whichever mm-hmm. you experience first, you're probably going to know, I'm guessing. Again, I've only mm-hmm. seen one episode. You're probably going to know where this is going. Uh, but this is, if you have no concept what this is, uh, this is about an outbreak of, of a fungal infection that essentially creates zombies. Um, it basically is a parasite that controls their bodies. Um, and uh, it's essentially a pandemic. And this guy is charged with getting this girl from point A to point B because there's something special about her. Mm-hmm. That's uh, all I really want to tell you. Uh, I just think it's one of the best premieres I've ever seen. And, oh, wow. Uh, I can't wait to watch more. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I'm going to watch this after I get done with the game. Uh, everybody, there's a, quite a few people in the chat who've watched me play this on the stream and everything. And yeah, it was uh, it was fun. The first The first day I was battling not only like stream issues, but I was also battling like, control issues like oh what button do i press to do the thing that i want to do and how does all this work and i was still working through that through the second time but it all but all that was making me die like a hundred times that first time and then i would die a few more times in the next one but i think i 
think I started getting the hang of this game a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, but uh, I can't wait to see this once this game. Once I finish this game, it'll be a unique experience. I think to yeah. have played through the game and then immediately get into the series afterwards. So, yeah, man. I think uh, I'm almost jealous uh, of being able to do that because I played the game. I don't know six years ago, whenever it came mm -hmm. out. Um, mm -hmm. And then there was the whole sequel, which is equally excellent. So I'm, if they decide to make a second season of this show, shit, they may do stuff in between the two games and stretch the show out to six seasons. But there's plenty of content um, there for them. And yeah, I just I really, really liked it. So yeah, <clears throat> HBO Max. All right. Um, so uh, one of our, I think one of our regular listeners, I know that he was actually on, like, uh, watching the stream last night. Actually, he goes by Martial Arts Film Freak, but his name's Tristan. He sent, he has sent us a whole bunch of. He sent, he basically sent me since it goes to the PO box and I take it and <laughs> put it in my and put it in my collection. But he sent us a bunch of martial arts films. One of them was a movie from 2011 called Shaolin, mm -hmm. uh, just Shaolin. Um, and, uh, it is about a, now you see Jackie Chan on there. Yeah, I was going to say that's Jackie. I would not call this a Jackie Chan movie. It, <laughs> funny. It's funny. Uh, it, it really, really added more depth to my Christmas movie argument about Die Hard. Mm. Like because Jackie Chan is in this movie, do you call it a Jackie Chan movie? I <laughs> guarantee you, you don't. Um, but, um, this is uh if if you've seen uh any martial arts movie has a familiar kind of premise to it where uh you know there's a there's a, an oppressive army of some sort that comes into a town and they they kill the town and they kill whoever's in charge of uh at the at the place and uh, we're introduced to the general who um who is uh who who takes over the town and he has a rival general who he who he's worried he's worried that that rival general is going to want to take the town for himself and so he orchestrates a thing so that he can kill the general and take over uh, and make sure that he doesn't take over this town and everything so for a lot to go right off the bat there's a lot of characters in this movie it's, a, it's hard to keep up with sometimes huh. but it's very interesting um so the general orchestrates this thing. The generals agree that his daughter is going to marry his son or something like that. But that's all in the guise of getting him into a room so that his people can come in and kill the general and everything. But meanwhile, the other, the, the, there's another guy, an underling who is sort of uh, behind the scenes. He's orchestrating his own coup and uh, he's hoping that both generals kill each other so he can just take power. Um, so a uh, big, huge thing, big, big, huge, huge battle ensues. Uh, this, the, the, the main guy that we've been following ends up sort of disgraced and he ends up out into, out into the countryside where he runs into Jackie Chan, who's just a little, who's just a farmer, I guess, of some sort or a, a cook or something. I can't remember what it is. Uh, it, he, all through the, all through the movie, he's like, ah, I know a little bit of martial arts, not that much or whatever. Of course, there's a Jackie Chan esque scene towards the end of the movie where he's doing all his Jackie Chan stuff, which is amazing. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but uh, this guy, this, this guy we've been following who has orchestrated all this stuff and, and uh, he's now disgraced and everything, he ends up joining this monastery and he starts learning the error of his ways. And the guy who was underneath him, who was trying to get power, is trying to come into the town and take it over. Mm. And it's a, it's a really good movie. I think you would really like Shaolin, Jeremy. I feel like this is right up your alley. It sounds as like far it. As as far as like Eat Man or the Raid or those type of uh, like action type of things, I, you're not going to see anything that like I don't think anything that's going to super blow you away if you've seen mm. those movies. But the but there is a lot of really good action in it, uh, and um, I was glad I, I never had heard of this movie before, and I was glad that I was recommended it. He put a little note. Tristan put a little note on this thing that said, uh, this is one of the best movies I've seen in the last, you know, best martial arts movies I've seen in the last, whatever the, the new millennium or something like that. Awesome. Anyway. Um, uh, it's only got like a 6.8 on the IMDb, but, uh, I, I really, really dug it. I really think it's great. Awesome. So, anyway. <clears throat> on my list, it goes. There you mm -hmm. go. Excellent. Um, all right. My second small recommend of the week 
is a comic book. A comic book. All right. Now, uh, our mutual friend Patrick um, spent the last year, year and a half, tearing through comic books. He's become a junkie. He buys them every week. He reads these omnibuses, these uh, you know collected uh, runs, um, and he's recommended several to me. And I've bought most of them, but I have yet to. I'm not the kind of guy who can sit down and just read for a couple hours. My brain just doesn't accept that. Mm -hmm. um, but I recently uh, had to wait for about several hours to see a doctor. Uh, and so I finally read Identity Crisis. And mm. this is, yes, that's the original cover. This is the collected uh, cover that I bought <laughs> for myself. Um, now, I will tell you right out of the gate that this uh, is considered a little controversial because a couple of the murders that happen in this are really violent. Mm -hmm. And there is a flashback to a, a sexual assault. Um, mm. and that may be triggering, and that may be a story that you just don't want to read. It's not like DC has never had <laughs> questionable decisions regarding its treatment of women. Yeah. Um, so uh, knowing that, um, this is essentially a seven issue murder mystery. Um, someone is killing loved ones of superheroes. Mm. Um, it starts with uh, the wife of the elongated man uh, and it carries on. I don't really want to say any more, but that's the opening of the book. So there you go. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> there is something that happened in the past that is impacting this investigation in many ways. Um, and there are a lot of characters you don't, see as often or at least i don't um like elongated man to begin with um mm -hmm. it's not a guy i'm super familiar with uh and there's uh, hawkman is in here and green arrow and zatanna who i think was in the first suicide squad movie uh mm -hmm. the suicide squad is mentioned several times in this run um and batman of course the world's greatest detective um it's ultimately probably going to be the one who solves this this series of crimes mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. i like how it brings in dozens of dc characters this is not uh like a batman run that they put together and called it identity crisis this is just a one-off mini series called identity crisis uh and it's just a an awesome murder mystery that happened to have superheroes in it and uh mm. i was riveted i was uh I, I read it like in two hours anyway wow so there you go if you like comics if you like dc uh, and, you know, you can accept that, you know, they have a history of not necessarily knowing how to write women. Um, <clears throat> mm -hmm. I thought I thought it was really good. I was riveted. So there you go. Yeah, I've, I don't think I've ever heard of this one, although I wouldn't be shocked to go back because someone sent us a whole bunch of comic books one one uh, a couple years ago or something. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if this was somehow in there. But uh, I have not heard of this one. I always love these murder mystery comic book things. I think those are like always rich material for them to explore in those things, like the long Halloween and yeah. uh, things like that. Those are always always a lot of fun. Um, uh, all right. I'm going to uh, slowly kill Dicer with my next recommend. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, I have wanted to watch this movie since it came out, but I never could get around to it. And I ended up finally watching under the silver Lake and, oh. um, uh, this stars Andrew Garfield and, um, it's, uh, it's a, it's a mystery. It's kind of big Lebowski esque, although it's not like a comedy, like big Lebowski or anything. Uh, but it, it, it's, you know, it's like an everyday guy who's not a PI who, who nevertheless finds himself curious about something that has happened mm. and, and, uh, is going, going down the rabbit hole to try to figure it out. Now, when this movie came out, I think a lot of, of, of criticism came its way because it's just a lot of it is like, huh, what, what, huh? You know, it's a lot of that kind of stuff going hmm. on. There's, um, and, uh, but the basic story of this movie is that Andrew Garfield gets, uh, gets interested in this woman played by Riley Keough, 
Um, and they start hanging out and it's like, eh, it's, it's kind of good. It's kind of fun, whatever. And then they're like, well, we should hang out tomorrow. And so he's like, yeah. So he comes out the next day and finds out that at her apartment, everything's just gone. There's just, she's gone. All the, all of her roommates are gone. There's like a symbol written in the, on the wall. Hmm. And he's like, I don't know. He's like, I have no idea. What, why would she do this? And he asks his super. Now, of course, much like Jeffrey Lebowski in the big Lebowski, he, uh, he, he owes his rent. He's got five days to get his rent in. Mm. Um, and so it's sort of the timing device. This movie tell, shows you so that you can know what's how many days have gone by because he's got five days. And then every time we see him on another day, it's like, okay, he's got four days and then wow. he's got three days. Um, but uh so he goes on this sort of quest to try to figure out what happened to her did she get uh, caught up in this uh this uh this terror there's a there was a prominent figure who uh who disappeared and then showed up later in a car crash and he mm. believes that she was in the car crash mm. um and was she involved in that did she did was there something that she was being killed for was she was it a cover up so he's going through the weird world of Los Angeles to find this out. He goes to these parties that are insane. Just mm -hmm. like, you know, remember like, remember when Harvey Keitel and Pulp Fiction is at a dinner party in the morning and Pulp Fiction, it's like that yes. type of thing. That's the, he's, he, Andrew Garfield goes to parties. There's like one where they're, they go to this huge estate and everybody's playing chess. <laughs> and, you know, and, uh, but like, there's a there's a he's he starts trying to he starts finding patterns in songs basically is what it comes down to there's this there's this whole thing where like okay there are really secret messages being sent to us all along but maybe they're not being sent to us maybe they're just being sent to other people hmm. and we just don't know what they mean and what they and what they're supposed to go towards and there's a point where he goes down a rabbit hole long enough where he gets a, he ends up at a place that makes no sense. It's all, it's, it's downright unsatisfying to find out where he ends up. Hmm. But the fascinating part for me is the fact that, that messages could be sent this way uh, out in the world and they're only meant for a certain people. They're not meant for you and me and they don't have any meaning even when you get there. Mm. Um, and sometimes when you get to get the answer that you want, it just ends up being the world be crazy. Yo, that's what mm. it ends up coming down to. And I think that's where a lot of problems may, people might have with this is because it, it ramps up intrigue and then it gives you an answer that it's like, I don't know if that's satisfactory or not, but I really, really dug it. I sat here and just, I, it, it, I don't know if you're like me these days when you watch movies, but a lot of times it's like, I'll watch 15 minutes of a movie and then I have to stop and then I have to go and do a whole bunch of stuff. And then I come back and watch another 15 minutes and so on and so forth. I watched this nearly beginning to end. Like I was in the theater. Mm. Um, and, uh, I think. I think Jeremy, you will love this movie. I think you will. I, it, it, I'm, 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 I'm going out on a limb actually thinking that you might like this movie. You might think it's the worst fucking piece of shit you've ever seen in your life, but I was so intrigued with it. I really, really dug it. I could have just been in the right mood to watch it. So, so anyway. I love Andrew Garfield. That's enough to get me to watch. Um, mm -hmm. But this is the guy that made it follows um which yeah. i found to be a very engrossing vibe kind of film um mm -hmm. and so yes i will now i when when i saw the trailer for under the silver lake i was interested and then i started seeing reviews and i became less interested um <clears throat> yeah but, um yeah i'm gonna bump it up the list a little bit more now uh, when I, usually i, I think you say i think you jeremy would like this um you're right so <clears throat> Yeah, I, like I said, I think maybe for the first time ever, I feel like I'm going out on a limb saying you'll love this movie. Hmm. So you may not, hmm. and just don't hold it against me. I just think, <laughs> I just think that you might be just as intrigued by this as I am. And I personally found the answers to be very satisfying. Interesting. Um, uh, even though the movie kind of lets you down a little bit, like you're thinking, oh, this is like 
there's some massive world type of thing going on here. It's very focused on what it says the messages are and what they mean. So I, some of these messages, by the way, are the way he solves them are a little bit like South Park made fun of this before. We're like, <laughs> you know, like where somebody, somebody says something and they get to the end of a sentence and they take the word at the end of a sentence and they go, well, that means blah, 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 blah. No. And then they go on to the next illogical leap. And then the co- he solves them kind of like that. in this, like <laughs> there's, there's some bullshit. Don't get me wrong. But uh, anyway, uh, I really enjoyed it. So, Excellent. all right. <sighs> on to the big recommend. I'm fine. I'm fine. It's just that you're so big. It's so huge. It's a good rule, but this is bigger than rules. It's bigger on the inside. Is it? I noticed. The big recommend. The inspector general. Well, mm-hmm. right out of the gate here. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to try our darndest and we should succeed to not say a certain word that is used <laughs> frequently in this yes. film uh, yes. to describe traveling hucksters. Um, yes. <clears throat> and uh, I'll just try and call them hucksters uh, because mm-hmm. it is not a word that in modern times is cool to use. Now, when they made the film, I don't think they had any idea that mm-hmm. this word was inappropriate, mm-hmm. may not have been inappropriate or considered as such at the time. But they're the Ro- Romani or Romani people. Yeah. I've never heard the uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, pronunciation, but uh, that's that's the the name to to use. But yes, <laughs> they use a particular word many times in the especially one, in a song that has that word in the title. Um, <clears throat> yes, Inspector General starts with a man racing on horseback into a town and a very Monty Python-esque joke where (laughs) the guard at the town yells for him to stop and he doesn't stop. So the guard fires into the air and that still doesn't make the rider stop. And he runs off and the, and the, and the soldier's looking like, and then a bird falls dead right next to (laughs) him. One thing that I find over and over, I hadn't seen this movie in 20 years before watching it for this podcast. It, It has so much of that DNA Oh, that we would later see in Monty Python and the Zucker Brothers movies, uh, but it also has the DNA of like the silent, like Buster Keaton, mm-hmm. Charlie Chaplin esque kind of does. humor. There's mm-hmm. a there's a scene in this where he's trying to drink from a fountain, and every time he leans in to drink, the fountain dries up, and then mm-hmm. he leans away, and the fountain shoots out again. And that just reminded me so much of like silent film era style comedy. It's, 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 Danny Kay kind of lives in between those two eras. Yeah. Uh, and li- listen, if you love Danny Kay, I think you love this movie. If you if you hate Danny Kay, which find that might be the case, um, I uh, don't think you're going to enjoy this movie because I really feel like this movie was pitched as, what if we just let Danny Kay do anything he wants? Mm-hmm. Um, and we'll expect it to be funny, and it largely will be. So... The guy riding into town is a mayor from a nearby town who has just had a visit from the inspector general. And the inspector general, nobody knows what he looks like because he blends in and he observes and he finds and roots out the city's corruption. And then he had people hanged and executed and put in prison. And this mayor is saying, you guys, you got to give me a horse and get me out of here and give me some Mm -hmm. money because you're a clean town. I'm sure you'll be fine. But the inspector Mm -hmm. general is probably on his way. Mm-hmm. And of course, as soon as he leaves, we find out that this is a very corrupt, dirty town. Uh, yes. And they make immediate plans to uh, make themselves look like a clean town. He even says, put ho- p- people in the hospital beds and open the schools back up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> deliver the mail from the last three months. I don't care how long it takes. Um, yeah. So this is just a, a corrupt uh, group of politicians, this city council. Um and so they are worried about this inspector general coming to town. We cut then to Danny Kay, and his, his name is Georgie, and his partner, one of his partners, Yakov. Yakov is really the main uh, snake oil salesman, and uh, Georgie is sort of his employee. Uh, and we see them selling this cure-all tonic, um, and it apparently tastes nasty. Danny Kay makes it the crack that yesterday we were selling this as uh, shoe polish. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, there's a woman who has 12 pennies and wants to buy a bottle. And Danny Kay is a good hearted guy. That's kind of the theme of the whole movie is mm-hmm. that he can't bear to see her use her last 12 pennies on a tonic he knows is not real. And in trying to give her her money back, he says it's not real, it doesn't work. And then the townspeople realize it's a scam and they chase them off. 
And at this point, Yakov says, I'm done with you. You keep screwing things up for me. Um, you, 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 he basically Encino mans him. He's just like, you go, you go now and um, I'm going to be on my own. So Danny Kay has no money. He has no food. Uh, he has a hole in his shoe and he decides to fill that hole with a piece of paper. Uh, he has a letter from Napoleon that they use in their snake oil act to, to try and mm -hmm. make it sound like this is a real tonic that Napoleon has endorsed. And he tears it at the bottom so that only a few words and a signature from Napoleon remain. And that will be important. <clears throat> uh, mm -hmm. And he stumbles into this town, super duper hungry. And uh, a horse follows him. And he gets arrested for stealing the horse mm -hmm. and thro thrown in jail. And then as the city council is discussing this arrest, they realize that is the inspector general disguised as a homeless person. We can't have him in jail. And so they do all this pomp and circumstance, give him a uniform, and they have this big banquet wherein he is humorously not allowed to eat very much until the beef stew portion is served. And then he <laughs> eats forever. And that's mm -hmm. pretty funny, too. Um, mm -hmm. And he falls for the kitchen girl. Um, the mayor's wife falls for him. None of that's very important. I even made a note. Imagine being told you've been cast as Danny Kaye's love interest and then finding out you're only in the movie for nine minutes. Um, yeah. But uh, basically what goes on for the next little bit of the movie is him awkwardly trying to play the role of inspector general, not really knowing what that is. What does an inspector general even do? One of the best pieces in the whole movie is this song where he has three different voices in his head yes he sings with and harmonizes with where he's trying to figure out how do i act like an inspector general is it arrogant is it elegant or is it smart um <clears throat> and they're almost like angel devils on his shoulder all arguing for you to act this way mm -hmm. um <clears throat> and that's probably my favorite musical number in the whole film because, yeah it's the uh, centerpiece you can just see how much fun he's having with the various costumes and then get to sing all four parts and the harmonies. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so then, uh, of course, Yakov stumbles into this town right as Georgie is about to get out of there. Because, again, he's a kind-hearted guy, doesn't want to take advantage of these people. Um, and Yakov convinces him to stay because this is the biggest con we've ever had. Um <clears throat> And there's something to do with an organ that the town paid 35,000 coins for, but then the organ was corruptly sent somewhere else and the people just po the, the mayor just pocketed that money. Uh, and that's what he uses to hook Georgie uh, to stay, but he really wants to take that money uh, for himself. <clears throat> and there's a, a scene in here right about this point where all of the city council officials come to try and bribe Danny Kay <laughs> all at once, uh, seemingly. They come like within 30 seconds of each other. And he ends mm -hmm. up, he hides the first one under the bed because that one says, oh, I can't let that person see me here. Um, and he hides the second one in the window seat. And the, the, and the third one in the closet. And then his twin gets <laughs> put in the closet. And then the other guy goes up on top of the bed. Um, and I swear to God, the people who made Frasier watched this yep. scene. And this was, I mean, it, it, this has to be one of the key inspirations for at least two episodes of Frasier that I can no think doubt. of. No um, doubt. And uh, I found that very humorous. The kitchen girl overhears a plot to murder the inspector general because, of course, we're corrupt. <clears throat> and Yakov um, intercepts her note. And, of course, a key story element here is that Georgie, Danny Kay, cannot read. He's illiterate. It's, in my opinion a little mean um, a little bit they they do they make some jokes at that expense yes um and mm -hmm. yeah i mean that i think they come off okay maybe but they are they are a little towards the meme side okay yeah and so he reads the note to danny k the note actually says uh they're going to kill you don't go to the barn and so he instead yakov lies and says oh she she loves you. You got her to love mm -hmm. you. She wants to meet you in the barn at midnight to kiss. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have this, this song with the word that we don't want to say, where there's a poison wine that Danny Kay ends up holding. <laughs> this is great, too. And he keeps doing this. Uh, and then we drink. And they all think, they get on the edge of their seats like he's going to drink the poison. He goes, but first we dance. And he keeps the song going. He does this thing where he assigns word noises to different groups of the party. Zoom, mm -hmm. 
ha, ha, ha. And then mm -hmm. he directs them, much like I have seen uh, uh, Bobby McFerrin do um, mm. a few years ago at a TED Talk. And there's a musical artist uh, named Jacob Collier who like conducts his audience at every concert. Um, mm -hmm. And that stuff has its roots back in this era. Um, and it's a very, if, if it weren't for that word, kind of being all over the place, it's a, it's mm -hmm. a hilarious scene. It's a yeah. wonderful musical number. And then <clears throat> uh, the real Inspector General shows up. <laughs> yeah, of course. And this, much, this part reminds me of the Iron Monkey a little bit. Um, because there's a plot line in the Iron Monkey where this kind of thing happens. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he very quickly deduces that uh, Georgie has a pure heart and uh, all these other people are corrupt. And then this movie is not wasting any time to end. I feel like the end is very rushed and I don't ultimately matter. I mean, I don't ultimately, I don't ultimately matter, but I yeah. don't ultimately mind um, because I've had so much fun. But I feel like once the real inspector general shows up, the movie's over in like eight minutes after that. Mm -hmm. Georgie becomes the new mayor. He gets with the kitchen girl. And for reasons passing understanding, makes Yakov his chief of police. Yakov has done nothing but evil to Georgie this entire movie and even conspires to have him killed in the barn. And yet he gets the job as police chief just because... They used to work together. I don't know. Yeah, like yeah. I don't like Yakov sending. Kind of like Biff Tannen uh, polishing George McFly's car at the end of the <laughs> Back to the Future. Um, and then, like like a lot of old movies that get their credits out of the way in the beginning, it literally just ends. Once it's done, it's like dun dun dun, black screen. Um, mm -hmm. And I found that pretty charming. Um, so I have several other notes I want to get to, but. Uh, that's a brief summary. What what did you think of the inspector? I think this was your first time to see the Inspector General. It's my first Danny Kaye movie, by the way. Mm. Um, I have I have not seen White Christmas. I always promise myself that I'm going to because I hear about White Christmas around Christmas every year. But uh, and I'm like I'm going to watch that, and I never do. Mm. Um, uh, and 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 the Court Jester and things like that. I haven't seen any of those movies. So this is my first. This is my first Danny Kaye movie, believe it or not, even though I've seen millions and millions of movies. Um, uh, it's interesting that you talk about like whether or not you like Danny Kaye uh, sort of uh, factors into whether you like this movie. I came off being stunned at his talent. Mm. There are some moments, and I don't know if it's just the time or, you know, the time that he lived in or, you know, he, he, he came off of, I think he came off of Broadway, just like a lot of these guys did. Um, but there are some expressions he makes that are mm -hmm. just so 1949 playing to the back row yep. type of things. And so, so when I saw those, I was like, Oh, I wish it was a little bit, not that. <laughs> um, but for the most part, um, I, I, I feel like the guy has just tremendous talent and you can't, you can't deny that looking at, and I, and I like Danny K just by just not saying I didn't like him. I'm just saying there's sure. some moments where I'm like, okay, that's a little grating. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but, um, when he does these songs that go through all those words that sound like each other, the consonants and everything, yeah. like yeah. just going through all of that. And it, that, that's just, that's just insane to me. That's just like that's a magic trick to, to be able to do it that fast and everything yeah. obviously can sing very well. Um, obviously ha is a, is a born performer. And I admire this, this age of Hollywood where they're like, Hey, you're a talented person. We're going to make a movie just centered around you, you doing stuff. Yeah. And that's basically what it is, is that <laughs> they put him in and they make him sing songs and they put like nothing is like plot driven. They're not, they're not selling the inspector general for its plot. No. They're selling it because Danny K is in the movie and, and you, you know what you're <clears throat> supposed to expect from Danny K at this point. And, um, even though I think he had just become a star, like a mm -hmm. movie star around this time, like he had already, people knew who he was. He had had uh, a few movies before this that had, had hit, but, um, but those songs are undeniable. His performances, like his, his, uh, uh, sort of ability to anchor each scene is amazing. That's that scene, that scene that you talk about with the poison wine is set up beautifully because at first, cause 
they're not even wanting to poison him. It's this dude who's in a, the council who was going to poison himself. Yeah. By the way, that character is amazing to me because he's he is I think he's shown as such a failure that he can't even quit properly. That's basically what it comes down to. Like yeah. he tries to quit, he tries to resign three times and they don't let him in this movie. Um, but he and then before before he can poison himself, he's the, the wine glass is taken from him. And and Danny Danny K does this whole thing with you know and, and now we drink and then but first we dance and blah 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 and I think it's just funny that the movie has set up this impossibly ironic song for him to do when he's like he's about to drink and everybody's got this anticipation and then they're like and then he d disappoints them at the end and then right after he throws the glass into the fireplace which is a sort of a I don't know if it's a recurring joke. There is a whole segment of people throwing glasses into the <laughs> into the fireplace and making the flames go up and everything. But he throws that glass into the fireplace, and that's when the song goes, and now we drink, and that's the <laughs> end of it. Um, uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of, like, beautiful centerpieces in this movie where, you know, you talked about nearly all of them, I think. the um, You know, the 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 big madcap farcical thing in the bedroom where everybody's hiding um you have uh you have the dinner scene which is funny one thing i don't know i don't know if this is the only way they could do this but they obviously speed up the footage and that's yeah. funny i'm sure back in 1949 that's like really funny like seeing seeing him like eat like that and it's all sped up but i kept wondering a guy with the talents of Danny K, if he could have done that on his own without speeding up the footage. And I thought it would have been really funny to see him just dive in. Now, maybe it's a situation where they're like, I don't know if we can get this in like a certain amount of takes. We may not mm. have the money to have him go through piles of food every single time, every single time and try to get this correct. But, uh, but I was, I kind of wanted to see that uh i i also i love the supporting cast in there i don't know everybody's name but one woman you're probably familiar with is elza lanchester who mm. plays the bride of frankenstein that's the mm -hmm. that's the one uh, uh one of the most iconic images in your head ever and when i first saw her i was like i know i've seen her before i know i've seen her before and then it was like oh yeah it's bride of frankenstein um but like when i saw alan hale's name i was like wait a minute is that the that's the skipper from gilligan's island isn't it no it's his dad that's his that's alan hale jr's dad uh who's who's in there um but uh but yeah there's a lot of like just i just love how this movie's set up this is a movie i mean they don't they really don't make movies like this anymore where yeah. they <clears throat> where they where you take a talented person and just say okay go just do your thing we're going to center, we're going to make everything around you. Every scene is just sort of like another sketch. Um, I love, I love that whole ending too. When the inspector general shows up, you're talking about how like, you know, the it's, uh, you know, he, he finds that he's the truly honest man, but they even find ways to make that like super, like, uh, like entertaining and on the edge. Cause you know, uh, dude puts the uh the letter from napoleon takes his takes his and puts it in in danny k's uh yep. thing and then they think he really is the inspector general and the other guy's an imposter and they throw that and, dude in uh, jail <laughs> yeah and they throw that dude in jail but then yeah like you said he danny k is playing a uh a very kind-hearted person they try to give him an order to, to uh, a death warrant for that guy and he's like i can't sign this i can't sign this and then the inspector general is like, ah, you are the most honest man I've ever seen in my life. You know, here, let's reward you for all this stuff that you've done in this movie. So, he says um, the most honest man I've ever I've met since Budapest, which is a <laughs> weird thing yeah, yeah, to yeah. say, but I guess it makes sense in context. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so. So, yeah, I, I did enjoy this. I, I got to tell you also, I ended up watching this movie twice, ostensibly, because um I watched it, it much like what I was talking about before with under the silver lake. I was watching this. I'd watch 15 minutes and then something would happen. I'd have to stop and then come back. And then when I start it back up and go, what was happening again? I don't remember all this. And, um, and by the end of it, I was like, okay, well, I think I can hang in a podcast, but I want to go over this again. So this morning I watched it again 
just to, to smooth over some of the rough edges that I had. And there's still parts in this movie. There's so many things that are so fast in this movie. I know I've missed other little jokes and, and fun stuff that they just kind of throw in. There's a, the, the smallest thing for me that I enjoyed in this movie is at the end when they decide they're going to have a celebration for the new mayor in the town and everything the guy's like and band music and the guy's like yeah and band music and he's like band music and he gives this laugh this <laughs> this it's a beautiful like like ending to that scene he's like really excited about the band music <laughs> a lot I of like these characters the... in here have a lot of like there's a lot of like really cool good and good supporting characters in this oh, even yeah. though danny k is the star i love the twins and their recurring misidentification and how more than one character like the, the the mayor who's leaving everybody's everybody's cousin in this movie by the way but with a mayor mm -hmm. who gives him the news in the beginning and who is leaving is kissing everybody on both cheeks and he gets to the twins and he kisses one on the right cheek, <laughs> kisses the other one on the left cheek and then he looks back and looks at him like wait a minute you're two people mm -hmm. and then danny yeah. k drinks the wine later or the champagne and then looks at the twin guys and thinks he's seen double from the champagne <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. and then they keep doing this i'm is it you can tell by this strawberry markham and they never let him show it and then finally at the end he pulls up his leg to show it and he's like I'm not Isaac. I'm Gizek. And the other yeah. guy has the mark on his leg. Yeah, I'm uh, certain too. A lot of that. <clears throat> I'm certain too. He points to his left and his right leg during both during all of them. Oh yeah. Like oh yeah. He, he switches them up. Uh, yeah. And eight says band music equal hanging. Yes. That those people who were once a part of the town who were who were the council of that town. They that's the that's sort of the implied thing about the band music is that they're all going to get hanged at the end of this because. Uh, yeah, they don't show up. They're not at the end. <laughs> they take the inspector general takes the mayor's necklace off and puts it mm -hmm. on Danny Kay. And the mayor says, My necklace. And the inspector says, We'll put something else around your neck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like yeah. Dark. <laughs> it's oh. really dark. It's so funny. Like that may be the reason why it got cut so abruptly to the ending. Mm. Is that there's not really any way to kind of like bridge that. And it becomes such a dark joke for that movie at the end. Like, you know, um, <laughs> so, uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, that's, that's a lot of fun. That hanging uh, joke. Yeah, it um, is. <laughs> I, uh, I, a couple of notes about this movie that I only learned in prepping for this podcast. This is based on a Russian play from 1836. Yeah. Um, which is just wild. And also, this movie is in the public domain. You can mm -hmm. download this movie, edit it up however the fuck you want, upload it on YouTube, no copyright claims issues. In fact, yep. there are, on streamings, there are multiple versions of this movie because of that fact. Yep. And I don't even know for a fact mm -hmm. if you and I watched the same one. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just wild to me that a movie... I imagine we did. Uh, was yours, like, color... I think this is a black and white movie, but it was it is. colorized. Yeah, it was. And... Yeah, and so I've watched the colorized version, which I I think is weird. It there's a definite like, um, I, I feel like something has been added to the to the print when you yeah. watch a colorized version. Uh, I did see the black and white available, but that through Amazon it was like you had to get another subscription to another service to watch that version. Um, but uh, I think we probably watched the same one that, that, uh, that Technicolor, uh, version that's first pops up when you, when you put in inspector general, but I, uh, um, I also love how often the subtitles were just like, I oh my God. Give up. Oh dude, <laughs> they're okay. So what's funny to me is that, yes, I'm, I'm not blaming the subtitle person. I'm sure that they have to go through like a million things a day and they're, and it's a thankless job and everything. But like one of the first ones that they say on there that's like inaudible was the guy the the guy who comes into town says uh the the you know his the mayor of the town says oh that's my cousin from this town and it says inaudible on it all the all the subtitle person had to do was wait until the end of that scene where the guy puts the money in the city funds yeah. and yep. it shows the town that he's from mm -hmm. and like they could have easily just substituted that there's other times where, yeah, they're saying stuff really fast and they end the sentence before they're done. And so it says inaudible, but there's some, you're like, oh, he said this, 
but I guess they didn't have a way of showing that he was cutting himself off or I don't know. But yeah, those subtitles were, uh, were special. <laughs> they were quite There's a no about it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, I am personally dying to know what your double feature option is for this bad boy. Be very, very quiet. Secret. What secret? A dirty little secret. I tell you something I've never told anyone. <laughs> Well, yeah, there's clearly a lot of movies out there with mistaken identity and things like that, uh, out there. Um, uh, the one that I settled on, I don't know if you've ever seen this movie, but this is a great, great movie. It is called being there. Uh, it's from 1979. It stars Peter Sellers. Hmm. Um, it is about a man who works as a gardener at this, uh, at this, uh, estate and the person who lives lives there dies and he has nowhere else to go um and he ends up at this other estate where melvin douglas uh, uh um is uh is the main guy he's married to shirley mclean um and um he goes there and he talks and he talks only in sort of garden speak he has no other like kind of way about him he he just talks about like yes we should all tend to our garden and we should all do this and do that and whatever so he but people misread this as deep thinking mm. and they start thinking that he is somebody who is who's who's a serious political player mm. and so this guy is very simple. He has no education. He has nothing, you know, he, he's, it, but he's just, he's just being himself. Uh, they, these people around him think he's a much bigger per person than he is. And by towards the end of the movie, they're already like, they're, they're already like, uh, trying to get him to be in a political party and run for president by the end of the movie. That's how far this, this goes. And as you know, it's talking about, this is a guy who has, who has no ambitions whatsoever. He just likes tending gardens and he just likes talking about gardens and things like that. And everything that he says is misread. So everybody around him is who pumps him up. And, uh, so it's the tone of being there is nothing like inspector general, obviously. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh this movie is built around peter sellers peter sellers obviously a huge huge uh great performer in his own right um uh but it's got that same kind of like story of like somebody who people think is much bigger than he is and they start acting in a certain way around him and everything hmm. highly highly recommend being there in fact i may make that a big recommend at some point since i don't think many people out there have seen this mm. movie. I had to read the book in college. So mm. I read the book by Jersey Kosinski. Uh, and then I watched the movie shortly after. So, um, yeah, really good stuff. Nice choice. I have not ever seen this movie, but I do love Peter Sellers. So, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. yeah, he is a, he is a, a similarly singular talent like Danny Kay in that he can, can do a lot, uh, mm -hmm. both physically, and you know with his acting um mm -hmm. but yeah i've never seen that i'll have to check that yep. out mm -hmm. all right what is um next week's homework all right uh next week's homework is a movie i haven't seen in quite some time but i know that i loved and i think it probably still holds up it's called eve's bayou um Ooh. and uh this is from casey lemons uh casey lemons may be best known as a director these days, writer director these days, but it, you saw her acting quite a bit in the nineties as well. She was Jodie Foster's buddy in silence of the lambs. Mm. Uh, but, um, but, uh, but the, but Eve's Bayou is a fantastic movie. Uh, it has Samuel L. Jackson, of course, making another appearance in uh, a Recotopia episode, Lynn Whitfield, journey Smollett, and Megan good. And it's basically about uh, a little girl who sees something involving her father that is sort of misinterpreted and it changes, uh, it changes the trajectory of this affluent family in new Orleans. Um, and, uh, and it's got, it's just like a deep mystery, a very moody kind of movie. 
Um, it's excellent. It is excellent. So um, I can't wait to revisit Eve's Bayou. Um, and I'm hoping a lot of you out there, this is maybe your first time ever seeing it. And uh, I am introducing it to you in a way. So um, so uh, I'm looking forward to that. Have you ever seen Eve's, Eve's Bayou? I have. I saw it uh, when it came out. Um, I think I rented it. I don't think I saw it in the theater. Um, but 98 probably around the time when mm, I saw it. Mm -hmm. I remember thinking it was great. I, I remember almost nothing else about it because it's been so long. Uh, mm -hmm. But this director also made uh, Harriet, uh, which I yep. really enjoyed yep. a couple of years ago um, with Cynthia Erebo. Um, <clears throat> so I'm excited mm -hmm. to see Eve's Bayou. Uh, those of you out there wanting to know where you can watch Eve's Bayou, it is free on the Roku channel. Um, otherwise, you will have to pay $2.99 or $3.99 to rent it from your I streaming believe service of choice. <clears throat> I also saw that it might be on criterion or something like if you've got yeah, criterion i don't think google pulls criterion into their results so that may be but that may be true if you have criterion you should be able to watch this but yeah i believe the roku channel was the one free service that i saw on this otherwise yeah you may have to pay a rental uh on this but uh it's worth, worth it yeah i guarantee you it's worth it and um and uh, i can't wait to discuss that movie next week i'm All right. giving you a no honk guarantee <laughs> uh all right do we have some uh, time for some uh questions i believe we do i believe we do question question i got something to say i want the truth i am listening when have two actors had far better on-screen chemistry on-screen chemistry than you expected and vice versa example the nice guys russell crowe and ryan gosling yeah that's a really good one um uh, John C. Riley and Mark Wahl Wahlberg in the in Boogie Nights was mm. uh, was one that I wasn't expecting, and you know John C. Riley, we're we're not quite. I don't know. He's not a a super known person by in 1997. He has a pretty good filmography at this point, though. Uh, so I don't know what I was expecting from John C. Riley and Mark Wahlberg, but the fact that he sort of an established actor and Mark Wahlberg, who was just beginning he was like in his two or like two or three years of acting at that point and we were still making marky mark and the funky bunch jokes at mm -hmm. that point when he came out with boogie nights i was surprised at their friendship and that that it clicks as well as it does uh in there and i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna credit john c Riley more than i'm gonna credit mark Wahlberg for that because i yeah. think john c Riley plays with everybody pretty well yeah he does um and then uh, another one, uh, the 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 flip side to this, uh, and I think it's just because the movie was so bad. But Billy Crystal and Robin Williams and Father's Day, mm. that felt like that should be so magical, and it just wasn't because the movie was not good, um, and and it just didn't give them a chance to to play off each other. And I think it may have came ten years late. Mm -hmm. in their careers mm -hmm. uh so um so that was that was the flip side i was surprised there wasn't more uh more chemistry to that so there is an episode of friends that opens with billy crystal and robin williams coming into the coffee house and the main friends are trying to have a conversation but they can't help but eavesdrop on robin williams and billy crystal mm -hmm. and i don't know the circumstances my guess is they were filming or promoting Father's Day around this time. It is one of the least funny things I've ever seen. And it's mm -hmm. clearly unscripted. They clearly said, we don't need to write anything for these guys. They will be funny. And Robin Williams does a funny voice and is crying about his wife or something. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just not funny. And I always yeah. skip that part because it's so not good. All right. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go with Jeff Bridges and Gil Birmingham in Hell or High Water, um, which is, I would never have paired them together in the first place. Um, I'm not 100% sure I knew Gil Birmingham's name before Hell or High Water. Mm -hmm. um, but the chemistry between them in that movie is incredible. And they have this bond as partners, but they just pick at each other. Bridges does more picking than... Birmingham does, uh, mm -hmm. but I just thought that chemistry was magical in a movie that already has magical chemistry between Ben Foster and Chris yeah. Pine. Um, so that was my answer. But yeah, the question asker, as often happens, stole the best answer with uh, 
the nice guys? And the uh, answer's in the chat. In the chat, we have from Tetsuka, Mark Wahlberg and Denzel Washington in Two Guns. I haven't seen that movie in forever, um, but I guess they were all right. I don't remember too much about it. I don't it. remember it much either. Uh, Josh Zero says, um, at the time, I did not expect Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson playing off each other so much in Wedding Crashers. It's a cliche now, but at the time, yeah, yeah. I, it, it is kind of interesting. Vince Vaughn, I always felt, was destined to be in comedies after Swingers and he seemed like he was trying to go more towards drama after that and mm -hmm. and and then so to see him in wedding crashers was kind of a fun comeback to to that or i guess um but yeah they, I, I wouldn't have expected them to be that great either uh jagged also said jagged says daniel craig and anna diarmas knives out showed it and 007 solidified it i agree mm. um mm. Uh, michael menza says billy crystal and gregory hines and running scared yeah uh jets Mets back to the future fox and lloyd yep and then uh shaggy nut says woody harrelson and jesse eisenberg uh so um yeah um yeah i guess it was now you see me um all right uh one do we have maybe one more one yeah more question? let's do this let's do this next one that's kind of short what is a good movie you missed watching in theaters because of a bad trailer um I, it took me forever to figure this out because I usually, I don't know. I usually watch everything that people tell me ends up being good. Um, so like a bad trailer, like somebody comes and says, Hey, this movie's great or whatever. Then yeah. <laughs> everybody says zombie land. Not now you see, now you me. see me. <laughs> <laughs> There's like five of them saying it. God. Yeah, but it's so funny. There's like Woody Harrelson and Jesse Eisenberg. Now I have to think of those movies and like, oh, I guess now you see me is that. Fuck it. You're right. Zombie You're not wrong. Zombie Land is the movie they're thinking. Of course, Zombie Land. <laughs> Just playing with you guys. Just seeing if you're paying attention. Oh, um man. uh anyway, the I usually see whatever uh, comes up, but the movie I didn't see because of a bad trailer was the Lego movie. Mm. Um and uh, I remember I remember I didn't watch it in theaters. We were on a plane somewhere. You watched it on the flight and I kept looking over at your screen and I was like, this looks pretty funny. I didn't, wasn't hearing anything that was going on. And, uh, and I ended up watching it like the next, like a couple of days later or something. I think you told me that it was good or I heard you laughing or something during it. I don't remember what it was, but, um, but uh but yeah that was one that i did not watch in theaters i thought that movie was just going to be trash and yes it is a giant lego commercial we understand that but it's got a lot of funny stuff in it man that movie is way funnier than uh, it really is than I honestly, just a regular like commercial i feel bad for the lego batman movie and the lego movie too because if the first lego movie didn't exist those two movies would probably be considered masterpieces but the first mm -hmm. one is just way funnier than anyone that has come since then um they'll probably reboot that soon um mm -hmm. for me it's cabin in the woods um yeah because cabin in the woods has a terrible trailer yeah and they were by, by almost necessity forced to try and keep certain elements about that movie from you in the trailer and it ends up playing like a straight up slasher movie because they they hide what that movie's really about because they somewhat understandably want to surprise you with it but they tip their hand on that like within 15 minutes of the movie so mm -hmm. i feel like the trailer i don't know i feel like that movie could have made a lot more money if people had known what it was um uh, you know before they made the decision whether or not to see it mm -hmm. um yeah, I, and and luckily for me, I was working in theaters when Cabin in the Woods came out, so I ended up watching that on a Thursday night and just loved it. I just wish that it had been a bigger hit in theaters. Obviously, the trailer turned everybody away because you know it looked like just an average, stupid horror movie with like a weird sci-fi thing that nobody that was unexplained in the trailer. Yeah, um, and uh, but. I was so hoping that would be a bigger hit because that elevator scene had oh. me rolling, oh had me God. rolling in like that Thursday night watching it. That's still um, one of the biggest laughs I've ever had. <clears throat> oh yeah, for sure. Um, over on the uh, comment side, that's not my name too. Says last one for me was spring breakers. Yeah. Spring breakers didn't have a very good trailer. 
Um, uh, Jagged says John Wick and Kingsman. Mm. Uh, trailers made them both look bad, ridiculous, and they ended up being awesome, ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, Turning Red from Shaggy Nuts. Uh, somebody else says Kingsman in there. Um, and uh, let's see, what else? Uh, WTFG says, I probably would have missed Magnolia in theaters because the trailer was tad, a tad confusing, but I caught a free screening by accident. Magnolia. I know it's controversial to say, but I really dug Magnolia. I watched that on a Thursday night. Of course, it was like super late before I got out of there because it's a three hour movie, but I really dug it. And the frogs came flying out of the sky. I was like, okay, this is a movie made for me. Um, (laughs) So um, Ah. anyway, uh, that's going to do it for today. Thank you so much for you guys coming out into the chat and correcting and correcting me when I say now you see me when I'm in <laughs> zombie land. Uh, really, really uh, appreciate you guys coming out here and uh, and uh, and watching us. Uh, without your support, we couldn't do this. So yeah. we're really, really happy that you come out every week and uh, watch you, us people. do this show. <laughs> uh, but uh, but uh, that's going to do it for this week. So we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. See ya. Bye. part of the live show by being a member of the sin club at patreon at patreon.com slash cinema sins chat with us on the cinema sins discord at discord.gg slash cinema sins or cinema sins twitter at cinema sins and email any comments or questions to recotopia at cinema sins.com that's r-e-c-o-t-o-p-i-a at cinema sins.com <laughs>when I saw it in the store and I thought this is pretty good. It doesn't taste like Sprite. doesn't taste like seven up, but it does have its own kind of citrusy thing. Mm-hmm. And then I found out it has high fructose corn sh- syrup in it instead of cane sugar. Yeah. And I was like, well, fuck that. So, but then I saw in the store yesterday, they had uh, a zero sugar version mm. and every zero sugar soda I've ever had is also zero calories, mm-hmm. but starry zero sugar has 10 calories. Yep. And I'm telling you, there's magic in those 10 calories mm-hmm. because it. I, I kept telling my wife, I think this is the real soda. They just put it in the wrong bottle. Mm-hmm. That's how freaking good it tasted. Oh, wow. So now I bought, went out and bought a 12-pack of it. It's like I'm actually excited for it to get cold so I can drink it. Let me tell you about a drink that I've been have been uh, a, a soda that I've been drinking for the past oh, two or three months now that you're, mm. When you hear about it, you're going to be like, Chris, this can't be good, right? <laughs> I hate Pepsi, right? I hate it. Um, I I can tolerate it. Hate is a strong word. I can tolerate it if you give it to me. Like if you go to those restaurants that are always like, oh, we only serve Pepsi here. I yeah. can I can drink the Pepsi. I can drink the diet Pepsi. I can't really. I can't drink the Pepsi. But, um, but there was something that I found a few months ago. Um. It was a mango diet Pepsi, no, a, day, a mango Pepsi zero sugar that I tried out and I was like, oh, oh, I can, pe- Pepsi can be delivered to me this way. <laughs> I had the mango regular. Uh, uh, this was before I started drinking zero sugar stuff mm-hmm. uh, and I liked it, uh, but I don't think I've tried the zero sugar. Mango. Yeah. I have tried the Pepsi, regular Pepsi, zero sugar, and I liked that. Mm-hmm. Um, but man, I, I realized that there's so much wrong with the world, but I, on the soft drink end, like we're living in utopia, we are. man. This is a golden age, man. We used to have uh, this place where we went to college called uh, Rosie's Tex-Mix. Then they had uh, co- a Mexican Coke by the bottle. Uh, and that, I think that was... The best thing about that place. I think the food was fine, mm-hmm. uh, but we went there for the Mexican Coke in a bottle. Yeah. 
cold Coke out of a bottle, <laughs> glass bottle, is the best tasting Coke. It, it really is. It's amazing. Man, they had, I don't think it's there anymore. The last time I went, well, maybe it was still there. They had, 15 years ago, my wife and I went to Epcot. And one of the first things when you walked in on the right was this, like, soft drinks around the world. Mm -hmm. And there were dozens of stations of you know, Japanese soft drinks and Indian soft drinks and European soft drinks. And there, some of them are, like, you know, don't sound like they would taste good or they're, like, vegetable-flavored. Um, but, again, all around the world, people have different palates. Mm -hmm. And I... I I got heartburn because I tried so many different sodas from around the world in that one little hut. Yeah. I don't ever get away from Disney without a stomach ache. Mm. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I've only been four or five times my whole life. It's not like it's not like somebody we know who goes like every other month. <clears throat> yeah. And I wasn't talking about Jonathan. <laughs> 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 I know he goes more regularly than uh, we do, but uh, mm -hmm. he will be hearing this podcast later, and I don't want him to think I was like... <laughs> Calling him out <laughs> without using his name. Right. <laughs> yeah, there was a a thing somebody posted uh, yesterday on Twitter that show that you know was that was all he said in the tweet itself was just the smartest people uh, talking about this this one thing here, and so it's about this athlete at twenty five who died, and all these tweets are put together. It was like, ah, blah, must be that vaccine. Does anybody want to talk about the vaccine? Can we start talking about the vaccine now? Blah, 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 all that stuff. And then <sighs> it, you go to the story. He died in a boating accident. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Hey, yeah, these, these mass shootings, remember, like, Columbine seemed like the worst it could get, and now it's like we have a Columbine, like, almost every day, it seems like. We really do. All right. I guess we can start and end on that depressing note yes, with the outtakes. Absolutely. And uh, I'll go refill my tea. Okay. <laughs>